the book of Judges in the Old Testament, uh, you remember how uh, the Bible starts with the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you're going to get into Joshua, and then you're going to get into Judges. All right, well, there you go. So anyway, so Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 24, and we're going to continue in our group of messages this morning on knowing God through the names of God. Beginning in Joshua, I mean in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 through 24. Here's what the scripture says, beginning in verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah. That's not Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite. As his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. Just a boy. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from me here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain until you return. Then Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, peace to you. And some folks, by the way, believe that to be a Christophany, okay, uh, 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 Old Testament appearance of the Lord. The Lord said to him, peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Shalom. To this day, it is still in, that's not Oprah, that's Ophrah, Of the Abiezrites. So a man who had been experiencing some particularly trying times in his life. Visited a pastor. Walked in before his pastor could say anything. He said, Pastor, before you give me any advice, I want you to know. I was raised a Christian by my parents. I'm an ordained elder in the church. I believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But my life is miserable. Can you tell me why? The pastor said to him, I don't know that I can tell you why you're miserable. But I am interested in knowing, have you ever met the God you tell me you believe in? There are many people who have great beliefs and great convictions. But they know little of the things that they actually believe in or are convicted about. It's true for a lot of folks when it comes to God and their relationship with him. They have... They've given their hearts to Christ. They've turned their lives over to the Lord. They've trusted him for their salvation. But while they would stake their lives on him as being the only way to heaven, the only way to find hope and help and healing and and so on in life, if you ask them why, they really couldn't tell you. Because there's a lot of folks who know what they've heard or they know what old preacher Smith has told them or old brother Bob has told them or old... Old Brother Brown over at the No Hope Baptist Church, you know. I mean, they know what they've heard. But they don't know the God that they even say that they believe in. 
And they've met him through somebody else. Maybe they met him through the preacher. Maybe they met him through some Sunday school teacher. Maybe they met him through a Bible study leader. Maybe they met him through grandma or grandpa or the great grandma or the great, you know, maybe they met him that way. But they don't really know that God personally, intimately, individually, in a way that their lives have been changed for the glory of God. But that's not the way that God really wants us to know him. It, it's not a proxy kind of God. He's not a God who, you know, you can, you can know him through somebody else or that you can connect with him through somebody else or you, you have a medium through which you go through. There is no medium through which we need to, to go through. He wants us to know him intimately, individually, personally, experientially. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know who he is. And that's the reason, really, we've been studying these names of God over the last several weeks. And the reason is because we want to know God in all of his grandeur, in all of his glory, in all of his magnificence. We want to know that God. And and we don't want to know him at a distance. And we don't want to know him through someone else. But we want to know him. We want to experience him. And we want to be aware of of not only his power and his abilities, but, but who he is. And that's why the Bible says, they that know thy name, will put their trust in thee. The Bible is clear as to what will happen when we really know this kind of God. Because when you know this kind of God, there is no doubt, there is no question, there is a confidence that you have in being willing to put your faith in him. Because you know who he is, you've seen him, you've watched him, you've observed him, you've learned him, you've come to recognize that you can can count on him and so because of that there is no problem putting your faith in him when you know a God like that and so the more you know who God is the more you're willing to experience him on a day-to-day basis through faith and the more you know him like that the more others can know him like that now we've already gotten to know him through a number of his names and we've looked at several different ones we've talked about him as El as Adonai we've talked about him as El Shaddai We've talked about him as Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Ro- uh, Rophi, Jehovah Nisi. Now, this morning, we want to talk about one that might be more familiar to you, and that's, that's the term or the name Jehovah Shalom. And I want us to follow the same pattern that we've been following over the last several weeks. I want us to look at the meaning of that name. Then I want us to look at the manner in which it's used, the context in the Bible that it's first used, because there is often, a lot of times, you, you don't necessarily... Uh, know this, but in in um, in interpreting the Bible, there are some rules that you can use sometimes, and one of those is the law of first mention. And a lot of times, when you use when you look in the Bible at the law of first mention, you can you can see how something's used, and that's the way it's really understood throughout the rest of the Bible. And so it hel- it's helpful to see the context in which something's used, so you can begin to get an idea how you are to apply that. So uh, we want to talk about the the meaning. We want to talk banner in which it's used and then we look we want to look like we have over the last several weeks at the message for us what does it say to us and how are we to really apply that so let's talk first of all about the meaning of this term jehovah shalom jehovah shalom is not something that most of us don't know about the lord who is our peace or the lord our peace if you were a jew the first thing that you would do if someone were to walk in your house or if someone were there for several hours and they were getting ready to leave, or maybe you were passing along the street sometime and you saw somebody, you, you know what you'd say? That's what you'd say. You'd say shalom. And the reason you would do that is because it was just a message of peace. It was a message of blessing in some way. It was sort of like what you and I would talk about as a good morning or a, or a, a good afternoon or a good evening or a goodbye. It was always a gesture of goodwill, it, it, it was a blessing to you that was with an attempt to try to convey health, wealth, happiness, wholeness, those kind of things to you. A lot of times when we think about peace, we typically think about peace in terms of primarily no wars or, or just the absence of conflict in our lives. And so we talk about peace in that way. But the word sh- shalom, it, it's really a whole lot bigger, it's a whole lot broader and it's a whole lot more rich in meaning than just uh, the idea of absence of conflict or no wars. It's really the idea, the best way to think about this term of shalom is really to think about it in the, in the perspective of wholeness. 
or from the view of being made complete, wholeness. For instance, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, the Bible says, you shall build an altar for the Lord your God, and it uses the word uncut stones. And the word translated there actually in Hebrew, uncut, is a reference to the whole stone. It's actually a reference to the complete stone itself, not one that had been molded in some way, not one that had been cut. It, it, was, it was really a reference to that entire stone as it was. And, and, and that's, that really is the idea of, of what the word shalom is. It's about wholeness. You remember Jesus asked the man who had been paralyzed uh, from birth. You remember how the, 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 the Bible describes him as being that way since uh, he was small and for 38 years, and he wanted to get in the pool, but he could never get there. And you remember how Jesus asked him, he said, wilt thou be made whole? Now, remember, he didn't ask the question, will you be healed? Do you want to be healed? Well, what would you think a man who's been paralyzed for 38 years would want? You'd think that fellow would want to be healed. Absolutely. That's just a, that goes without question. You wouldn't even ask that. But Jesus didn't ask him, do you want to be healed? Naturally, he wants to be. Of course he wants to be healed. He's been that way for 38 years. But Jesus asked a more important question, a bigger question, a deeper question. He said, wilt thou be made whole? And that's a different thing other than just being physically healed. Jesus was looking at something that was a whole lot more important. Well, when it comes to this thing of shalom, that's the idea. It's about wholeness. It's about completeness. Um, it's, it's that settled sac uh, satisfaction inside of you where everything sort of just fits together. All things fit for you. It's complete. For instance, have you ever found yourself putting one of those puzzles together, one of those big puzzles, one of those gigantic puzzles? You know, 1,000 pieces, 3,000 pieces, whatever it is, and you work for hours. Sometimes people will work for days on those things. And you work for hours, maybe for days, on putting those things together, and you get to the very last, and inevitably what's happened? You're missing the last piece. How in the world does that happen? But that happens. Well, that's sort of the idea when it comes to this thing of shalom or the idea of of completeness or wholeness it's it's that it's that unsettled dissatisfied feeling uh that you've got when you can't complete that puzzle but when you do complete that puzzle you put that last piece in that feeling you get of wow this is done it's whole it's complete that's what it means when you talk about shalom it means there's no pieces that are missing everything fits Everything works together. It's perfectly synchronized, and there's this settled satisfaction, this wholeness about your life, both on the inside and on the outside. That's, that's what shalom is. So let me ask you a question this morning. Is that the way you came into this building this morning? With that, with that settled satisfaction, that wholeness, about you, that completeness about you? Is that the way you're going to get up and go to work on Monday morning? There, is there that wholeness about you? Is there that completeness about you? Is everything fitting together? Is there that perfect synchronization of everything in your life? Well, if not, that's what we are looking at this morning. And so in terms of the meaning of the term itself, shalom, that's what it is. It's not just the absence of conflict or the absence of wars or the absence of difficulty. It's really the idea of completeness and wholeness. Now, let's talk about the manner in which it's used. How is this word used or this term used in the Bible? What's the context? Well, in the larger picture, it fits in the context of this continuous cycle of sin that Israel finds themselves in in as a nation now remember up to this point god has brought israel out of egypt he has been their deliverer he's shown himself to be their healer he's shown himself to be their provider and their sanctifier and and he's and he's called them to be separate he's called them to be sanctified he's called them to be holy and consecrated unto him and he set them apart and he said now you are to be a uniquely distinctly different group of people so when it comes to you and me as a church, that's, that's sort of the application for us, is that he has sanctified us. In fact, the New Testament says that we have been washed, we have been 
sanctified. Now, sanctified doesn't mean that you're a holy roller. Sanctified doesn't mean that you've got some sort of attitude about you because you're better than everybody else. That's not what sanctification means. And yet there are those who sometimes carry that air about them because they think they got more of Jesus than somebody else. So that's not sanctification. Sanctification simply means that you've been set apart by God under holy use. That simply means you belong to him. You're to be undiluted. You are to be purely and wholly committed to him. So they would do this with instruments in the Bible and those kind of things. They would do this with the things in the temple and the tabernacle. They were sanctified, set apart unto God. That simply meant they were to only be used for his use, nothing else. Now, you can do all you want to do in eating a fork with a fork, but if it's set apart unto God, it's only the way God says it's to be used. Now, in the Bible, for you and me as a Christian, we are sanctified. That means we are, we are set apart only unto his use. And so we are to be holy. We are to be a uniquely, distinctly different group of people as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not to look like, to sound like, to walk like, to talk like. We're not to be like the world. We are to be different from the world. And so God has said to them, now I've done all of this for you. I've set you free. I've delivered you. I've saved you out of Egypt. I've provided for you. I've brought you to Canaan. I have sanctified you and said you're to be uniquely and distinctly different. Now they're in Canaan. They've been there about 200 years. Moses is gone, great man of God. Joshua's gone, great man of God. And sure enough, everything God told Israel not to do, guess what? They did. They started intermarrying with some of the other nations among them. They started worshiping like them. They started walking and talking and acting like them. And the result was they had their home in Canaan, but guess what they were living like? They were, they were living like they were still back in Egypt. Sound familiar as Christians? We get saved, but we still live like what we were before. Some of the unconquered nations, like the Midianites, they were plundering, they were pilfering everything that belonged to Israel. They were living like paupers in a land that was supposed to be the land of plenty. So they cried out to God. And God being the God of mercy that he is, he stayed the hand of judgment on them once again. He went over and he got a guy, a young guy by the name of Gideon, to go up against the Midianites to destroy them for being adversarial antagonistic towards the things of God. But interestingly enough, what God found out when he got to Gideon was that Gideon was sort of the personification of the nation of Israel as a whole. That is, he was, he was full of fear, totally fearful, afraid, doubting, worried about the circumstances that he saw around him just as much as Israel was uh, with the circumstances they saw around them. And so what was true of Gideon individually was also true of Israel nationally. They didn't have any peace. They were uncertain. They were, all, they were all stewed and stressed and worried about everything, struggling with everything. They had sinned against the Lord. They weren't seeing the blessings of God on their lives. They weren't seeing the blessings of God on their families. They weren't seeing the blessings of God on their, on their homes, on the nation as a whole. And, and the reason was because they had turned away from God. And so guess what? They weren't complete. They weren't whole. They were all stewed and stressed out over everything. And there was a hole in their soul that was the size of the Grand Canyon. They had left the one piece out of the puzzle that you got to have in order to have peace in your life, to have peace in a nation. And so in those kind of conditions, there was no peace. And so God came to say to them and to show them that I am Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. And ladies and gentlemen, it's in those kind of conditions that that very same God comes to you and to me today and to this congregation. And if you're full of fear, if you're full of doubt, or if you're afraid, how are you going to live? Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? How are you going to get the money? Where is it going to come from? How are you going to accomplish this? If you're worried to death whether you can do what God's telling you to do, whether you're capable, whether you're able, whether you're going to have the time, the strength, the energy, the knowledge, if you're not sure what the doctor's going to tell you tomorrow, 
And you're not sure what, what's going to happen at work when you go in on Tuesday. Maybe your life is just in a mess. Maybe it's just a mess because you've left God out of your life, and your life is, in fact, that thousand-piece puzzle right now. It's a mess. Let me tell you, God is a God who comes along, and he is the kind of God who puts the pieces of your life together. He doesn't tear them apart. And what you and I need is not an answer to all of the little questions that we can't answer. What you and I need is the one piece of the puzzle that gives shape and wholeness and completeness to an unfinished picture. Let me tell you who that is. That's God in Christ. That's why our Bible says, your Bible says it in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14. He says, it is Christ who is our peace. See, we ask big questions sometimes because we have a little peace. But I want you to know, here's what I've learned. I've learned the bigger the peace of God is in your life, the smaller the questions and the fears and the doubts and the worries become. We have big enemies because we have little peace. And and so the meaning of this word is the idea of wholeness and completeness. It's that settled satisfaction down deep inside where everything is working together and it fits together and it's right in the, in the grand scheme of the purpose and plan of God. And the manner in which it's used, it's used in the context of doubts and fears and worries and consternation and concern and uncertainty. And in the context of that kind of world, this God comes to us to say, I am Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace in the worst of times. So that's the meaning of it, and that's the manner in which it's used. But let's talk about the message. What is the message for us? How do we apply it? Well, I think you apply it in this context. That if you're fearful and you're doubting and you're full of worry and stress and anxiety, then you apply this God who is the God of peace to your life. You know what fear is? Think about what fear is. I think I've mentioned this to you before. Fear is just the perception that you and I are losing control. Think about that. Fear is just the perception that you and I are losing control of something. When in reality, I've got a news flash for you. You and I have never had control anyway. But fear comes along and makes us think that we're losing control of something and we get all concerned and all upset and all stressed out. Listen, the only thing that you and I can, the only thing that you and I have got any control over in this life really are the things that we're willing to to give up trying to control. It's just like when, you know, you go into a tailspin on ice in a road. Have you, ever, have you ever watched what, you know, weather guys will tell you this? If you ever find yourself in a tailspin on ice in the middle of a road or something like that, they'll tell you a couple of things. They'll say, take your foot off the gas, turn your wheel into the spin, and don't push on the brakes. Now, here's another way of saying it. Another way of saying that is stop fighting against what's happening. Stop fighting to get control. The only way that you and I ever really get control of anything is when we stop trying to control everything. Because we don't really have control anyway. It belongs to the Lord. And that's the way fear is. Fear is just just fighting to have control of something that you, you know you and I don't have control over in the first place. And here's, here's a follow-up to that. The follow-up to that is worry is just the first cousin of fear. It's so funny if you ask somebody sometimes, I'll ask folks, are you afraid? Are you fearful? Um, no, I'm just worried. Well, that's, what, that's the first cousin of fear. Worry is the physical side of fear that puts your insides in a stranglehold. 
You know what worry, worry comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word that means to strangle. That's what worry is. Worry will mess you up physically. Worry and anxiety will get you all in knots. It'll get you, it'll give you headaches, it'll give you stomach aches, it'll give you back aches, it'll give you ulcers. It'll do all kinds of things to you. It will absolutely mess things up in your life. Man, I can't think of a of a of a whole lot better of of uh, of a whole lot better more better ways to live my life than without worry. I don't want to have to live every day bound by fear and anxiety and consternation and worry and doubt and questioning everything. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be knotted up all the times about everything. I think I'd rather have the peace of God in my life. I'd rather have a completeness and a wholeness and a sense of meaning and a purpose. Of it. And guess what? Here's the truth. You can. You can have that. Here's how. The presence of God first. The presence of God. See, you can't have the peace of God. Now, listen carefully. You can't have the peace of God until, first of all, you've got peace with God. So, so think about that. There are a lot of folks who are miserable in life because of a lot of things. And they try a lot of different solutions to feel better in life. But you can't have the peace of God in your life that gives that kind of wholeness and completeness and settles that hole in your soul until you have peace with God. Until that chasm is crossed. Until that barrier is broken. Until that great uh, divide is settled. You can't have what you're looking for. The peace of God is the byproduct of having peace with God. And you don't have peace with God until, first of all, you've got the presence of God in your life. And you know what the presence of Almighty God is in your life? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. The Bible says the angel of the Lord came to Gideon in verse 11. The Bible says the angel of the Lord said, the Lord is with you in verse 12. It, 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 peace wasn't possible for Gideon until he knew he was right with God and he, and he had God with him. And that's why Gideon asked, Lord, if you're with us, why, why is all this stuff happening to us? Where's all the miracles? Where's all the things that we were talking about and thinking about and looking forward to? In other words, it doesn't look like you're anywhere around, oh God. And in verse 13, he said, you've abandoned us. He needed to know that, that God was with him. He needed to know that the presence of Almighty God was there. Let me tell you something. You will never know the peace of God until, first of all, you've may, been made to have the peace with God and you got the presence of God in your life. We think peace is a place you get to. Particularly in our world today. If, if the... We think if the, stock, if the stock market doesn't crash, if everybody's armies stay on their side of the, of the line, if, if the washing machine doesn't break, if the car keeps running, if bills don't get any bigger than, than, than what they are in my bank account at the moment, then we're going to have peace. In other words, if none of my circumstances change and everything is the way I want it, then I'm going to be at peace. But, but here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, but I don't give you peace like the world gives you. The peace that Jesus wants to give you and me is different. Because it's not the kind of, the, uh, of peace that the world gives. The world says peace is a place you get to. Peace is predictable circumstances. Peace is when all of the stars align and all of the circumstances of your life are just like you want them. And the world says that's peace. That's when everything feels good. But Jesus says peace isn't a place that you get to. It's not a feeling of euphoria. It's not having the perfect set of circumstances in your life. Peace, Jesus says, is a person. And Jesus said this, peace I leave with you. I give you me. Jesus was saying, I'm giving you what you need. You need me. Peace is a person. Peace is him. That's why Ephesians chapter 2 said, but now in Christ Jesus, you were formerly far off, and you've been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. 
who broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Real peace, real completeness, real wholeness in your life comes from having a relationship with Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. You will never fill that hole in your soul until you fill it with Jesus. That's, that, that's what... That's what C.S. Lewis used to talk about, that God-shaped vacuum that exists in every single one of us. That sometimes when you lay your head down at night and you, you, you are all alone and you're, you're asking yourself, why am I so dissatisfied? Why am I miserable in life? Why does nothing add up for me in life? And you keep trying to settle that and you keep trying to answer that. And so you say, well, you know what? I must need a new job. Or, or, or if I could just get a new car or a new home. Or if I could get more money. If I could do this. If I could get, get, get. And God is saying to us, know the answer for the hole in your soul is not more stuff. It's me. It's Jesus. He's your peace. You will never have the peace of God in your life. That wholeness you're looking for until you have peace with God. Through Jesus. That's the message. He is Jehovah Shalom. And he brings wholeness, healthiness, completeness to your life. What's the message for us? The message is you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be bound by fear. You don't have to be bound by doubt. You don't have to be bound by misery in your life. The answer is first the presence of of almighty God, which is Jesus, the presence of God. Secondly, it is the will of God, the will of God. That, that is, you, you got to be doing his will. Jesus said, you remember, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then his righteousness, and then when you've sought the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all of these things will be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know what that phrase, the kingdom of God, means? It means the rule of God in your heart. That's the kingdom of God. If you've got a kingdom, you've you got to have a ruler. Well, Jesus is the ruler. Well, what's he going to rule? He's got to rule your heart. The kingdom of God, it means the rule of God in your heart, in your life. Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. He's talking about you and me submitting our lives, submitting our hearts to God and being led and ruled and reigned by him in the heart. You can't have the peace of God in your life and be living for yourself. Somebody's well said that you'll only do two things with, the, with self. You will either deify yourself or you will deny yourself. You only got two options of what to do with self. You can't. You can't live for yourself. You can't live with yourself as the master ruler of your heart and still be doing his will. There is no flirting with God's will. It's only doing God's will. And this is what happened with Gideon. God came to Gideon and he gave him an assignment. And from Gideon's perspective, it didn't look like a job for him. You know, Gideon said, wait a minute now, God, wait just a minute. I'm from the smallest tribe. I'm one of the youngest guys around. I, I'm, I'm one of the youngest of the bunch. And so God said, all right, we'll go out and fight against the Midianites and defeat them. And there was no other option for him. He didn't give him another option. And so Gideon did what God said do, and he went. And when God had assured him of his presence and that it was his will, the Bible says, then Gideon heard God saying unto him, peace unto you don't fear i'm with you see peace is going to be a problem for you if you don't have the presence of god and you're not doing the will of god in your life so many people who want to figure out why they're so miserable in life but they can't figure it out but yet they keep doing the same things they've always done it's like the, the lady who said, you know, she's, she thought she had 20 years of experience as a Christian. She, she didn't have 20 years. She had one year experience repeated 20 times. And, and, and that's what happens to a lot of us in our Christian life. It's like the, it's like the lady who was, 
talking, you know, tuck the little baby, you know, or not the baby, but the, 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 the youngster in bed one night. And all of a sudden, she heard the plop on the floor. She came running up, asked her what happened. And the kid said, well, I guess I, I fell asleep too close to where I got in. There's, there's, there's a lot of that that happens in the Christian life. We get saved and we, we get set apart and sanctified. And God comes along and he does his great act of grace, that amazing grace through the cross in our lives. And then we start living the way we used to and we start doing what we used to and we stop living under, surrendered, yielded to him completely. And we start living out of our own selves. We deify ourselves. And in doing that, we're missing the will of God. And we can't figure out why we're miserable. Why aren't we happy? Do you know something about the will of God? I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The the thing about the will of God is this, that the will of God is always consistent. Meaning, if you you want to know if it's the will of God or not, it's always consistent. That is, it's never going to violate the word of God. It's never going to violate Scripture. It will not be counter to what this Bible says. If it's the will of God, it's going to be consistent with what this Bible says. Not only is it consistent, but it's also persistent. You know what that means? That means it's not going to ever, ever, ever stop. It's going to always be with you. It's going to always find you. When you lay your head down at night, it's there. When you get up to go to work tomorrow morning, it's there. When you turn the corner somewhere across town, it's there. Everything you look at. Everywhere you go, every person you talk to, it's like it's this screaming kind of thing. The will of God is always consistent with the word of God, and it is always persistent. It just doesn't stop. And I'll tell you something else about the will of God. Not only is it consistent and persistent, it's always insistent. You know what that simply means? That simply means you got to do it. It won't let you go. It grips you. This was the way it was with me. I remember years ago when, uh, bef- when I was being called into ministry, I struggled with going into ministry. I battled with going into ministry. I didn't really want to go into ministry. I'd seen my dad and the challenges and all that he went through in ministry, and I just didn't want to be part of it. And I never will really forget how much pressure God put on me through the will of God, through his will, and, and the kind of stuff he showed me and the kind of stuff I saw. But I'll never forget stepping in the shower one morning, and he literally said to me, and I don't know how I No, he just literally said, you will never have peace until you say yes. And that's where I answered the call to ministry, was in the shower one morning, because God wouldn't get off my back. I mean, the will of God is that way. It's always consistent with the word of God. It's always persistent. It'll hunt you down and stay after you. And it's insistent in that it says, you've got to do it, because if you don't, no one else will. Who will? And if we're not doing the will of God, if we're not yielding to the will of God and submitting to that and we're fighting against that and struggling with that, let me tell you, you are going to have problems with that sense of wholeness and completeness and value and purpose in your life. It's the presence of God through Christ and it's the purpose of God through his will that we find wholeness. Finally, it's the word of God, the promises of God. Verse 23, he says, peace to you. Don't fear, you shall not die. That's the promise of God. That was his promise. It was the word of God. And the Bible says that his promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. It's as good as done if his word says it. And so if if you're struggling this morning, and that's the question for all of us, that's the question for you, is... Is, is how you came in this morning. What is it that's, that's keeping you from knowing God, from living out your life dependent upon this God, God who is known as Jehovah Shalom? What's keeping you from walking in that today? What fear is it that you're bound by? What, what concern is it? What situation is so preoccupied your way of life or your thoughts that you're, that you're just a mess now and it's constant consternation and you're constantly knotted up and you're constantly uh, battling with physical problems or maybe you're constantly worried about something because you just can't find that settled satisfaction. What is it that's got you so bound up? Then the God 
who is Jehovah Shalom, meets you here, not to put you in more pieces and to make you a 2,000-piece puzzle. He meets you here to put the puzzle together, to complete you, to make you whole. What person would not want to be whole when they walk out today? Jehovah Shalom. I am the God of peace. What about it? Maybe you can't figure out any of that because you can't even figure out the relationship side. Maybe you don't have any hope of having the peace of God because you don't have peace with God. Start with a relationship with Jesus and then lean, live under, Yield yourself to him, the presence of God, the will of God, and the word of God. His presence, his purpose, and his promise. Let's bow down. Let's stand for prayer. No one looking around. Stand for prayer. No one looking around. Every eye closed. Father God, even in this house this morning, there's those that have walked in. And on their way to this house this morning, there was so much defeat, so much discouragement, so much doubt, worry, anxiety, crushed by the weight of issues and challenges in their, in their lives. My prayer is, God, today that those things we don't neglect and we don't deny that they exist. We acknowledge them. That we can stand with you as you stand with us and those things take on a new view. While we may have those things that we are over in Christ, we don't have to be under them. And so God, it is my prayer that for those in this house this morning that came in, with those challenges, that they would leave today fully assured and filled with the God who is the God of peace. God, some in this house are making decisions. They've got decisions that are big decisions that have to be made. And there's confusion in their life. And there is, there is uncertainty that they're faced with in front of them. God, some of them are trying to make decisions and they're trying to do things and they keep bumping into the same wall. May we be reminded and learn today that you are a God who brings peace. Not confusion, not questions, not doubt, but peace. Speak peace to your people in this house today. For those that have, uh, don't have a relationship with you, God, today in Christ, it is my prayer that you would put your finger on their hearts, that you would challenge them, enable them to hear your Holy Spirit calling them today, and that they would say yes, yes, yes to a God who loves them. Whatever you need to do in this hour, this we acknowledge is your time, and in these moments, this is yours.